Hi, everyone. I am so excited that you are all here um, tonight to talk about social studies. I started an organization with two women called um, Roots to Revolution. And what Roots to Revolution does is we teach people about the history of systemic racism in the United States. Um, and we teach people to unlearn the dominant whitewashed narrative that we have often received about American history education. And so we really want people to understand the true history of America um, and how we can use it as a tool for activism today. And so I'll talk a little bit more at the end of our conversation today about how you can get more involved in Roots Revolution if you like our session that we're, we're engaging in tonight. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, you're all here, you all must care about social studies education to some degree, um, but I just want to share some statistics about why social studies education is so incredibly important. Um, so just take a second right now and read those first two bullets on the screen, and then I'll talk through it a little bit. So... In the United States, um, even before we were seeing book bans and critical race theory bans, um, civic education and social studies education was not doing well. Um, so when we think about the fact that only 7% of high school seniors can name that the cause of the Civil War was slavery and only 26% of Americans, that includes adults, could name the three branches of government, we have, we have a big problem. Um, the other huge problem that was done by um, a study was from the Zen Education Project was that Reconstruction is a time period in American history that is most glossed over in U.S. history curriculums. And that's a real problem because it's a time period in American history where Black people achieved a lot of power and then there was white backlash to it. And so if we study this time period deeply, we can affect change today by looking at the missteps and looking at the ways in which Black people also really fought to have, have great power. And so these are some of the big reasons why I think it's so important for our kids to have a strong social studies education because we're lacking it as a nation. Um, more recently, so there have been bans in history education across the country. Um, so in 2023, there were 227 bills that were introduced um, attacking LGBTQ history. Um, we saw book bans in school districts across 32 states. Um, we saw states ban what they called critical race theory, which is really just a euphemism for banning Black history. Um, and of course, you probably saw the state of Florida banning AP African American history. Um, as well from from the schools and you know this is by design which we will talk about you know a lot more in this conversation of why um this is this is happening okay so history is also being erased from schools um that are in progressive states as well and a lot of that is because teachers are very well intentioned but especially in kindergarten through fifth grade, teachers are teaching all five subjects. Um, and when there is so much emphasis on math and English scores, oftentimes history and social studies and science is, is what gets cut. And so I just want you to think about if you're a parent, um, some of these questions, and if you're not a parent, questions to be asking at your school board meeting. So take a look at the list of these questions here and just go ahead and share in the chat um, just some of your thoughts about your child's education. So I'd love to just hear from some people um, in the chat. Just do you know the answers to these some of these some of these questions? All right, seeing from Dana, my son never has social studies homework. Thank you, right? No, no. Okay, same. Right, only three years are required in high school, semester. Okay, so I'm, yeah, Connecticut's a state that's doing really great progressive things with social studies education. Um, Connecticut requires indigenous history, black history, um, civics education. No social studies. Okay, maybe one project in elementary school. Great. Um, 
why do you think I ask in this series if a child is only using a textbook? Why do you think it's important to, that kids not just use only a textbook? Love some, for someone to maybe come off mute and share. See Amber, Amber in the chat, you put bias, bias and whitewashed. Why do you, why do you think it's important for kids to have less than just, just not, not just a textbook? Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, it, it's the same old stories. You know, you get the same three people of color and you don't get things like the Wilmington riot and, um, it's all about wonderful, wonderful things that we did and none of the um, tragedies and, or, you know, challenges and, but also, you know, um, Black Wall Street and none of the other celebrations either. Um, and, you know, one of my students said last year, um, you know, was there only four Black people that did anything important because I swear if I hear about Harriet Tubman one more time, is there not anybody else? And so um, the, there's just so many things wrong with just the textbook. Absolutely, yes. And the New York Times to even just further substantiate what Amber is saying, the New York Times did a study of textbooks and they found that textbook companies um, design the textbooks to suit the political narrative that they are serving. So in California, the textbook is written one way and in Florida and Texas, the textbook is written another way because California is liberal. And so the, the companies produce a textbook for that market because California, Texas and Florida are the biggest textbook markets. And then for Florida and Texas, they write a different version of the same of the same textbook. And so it's in kids. There are useful textbooks that kids can read for background knowledge. Right. I'm not I don't think we need to throw out all the textbooks, um, but what kids need to learn how to do is how to interrogate a textbook, how to find the bias. The questions that Amber mentioned of students saying, why are there only four black people in this textbook? That is an incredible question for a child to be ans asking because they realize there is a bias and there is a problem. Um, and so it's not bad that teachers use textbooks as long as they're supplementing textbooks with primary sources and, and other other things. And so these are questions that, you know, and, I, and people are asking in the chat if we can share the slides and I'm happy to do that at the end. So you have this. Um, these are these are questions to be asking about school districts and your um, child's education to advocate for them. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about what strong history instruction can look like um, and then what that power, what power that holds. And so I'm going to share with you actually a, a lesson that I teach to my students. And I want you to think about as we kind of walk through pieces of this lesson, how is this form of instruction em empowering? What critical thinking skills are developed in this lesson? And what myths does this lesson um, bust? And so this is actually a lesson, if you're um, an educator, you may be familiar with this. It's a lesson from a group called the Stanford History Education Group. Um, if you're not an educator, this is a group that you can um, make educators aware of. They do excellent curriculum and really powerful thinking. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop this document in the chat. So if you can scroll down to the end of the chat and everybody click on that document and make a copy of it for yourself. And we are going to be history students for a moment. So put on your history student cap. And as we go through this, I also want you to think about why this type of instruction is, is valuable and why some politicians would want to ban it. So it's gonna be a lot easier to, I'm gonna share my screen, but it's gonna be a lot easier for you to read the documents if you're in the document yourself. So please make sure you're in the chat um, looking at that. So I want to just start off with, this is a question we ask students, right? Why were the Montgomery bus boycotts successful? Um, and so we're gonna analyze that question today and take a look at 
the significance of these bus boycotts. And this is a lesson I kind of do with eighth graders. So I want you to think about maybe, we're talking about it on an adult level, but how might this really help an eighth grader who's learning about the bus boycotts for the first time? So I want you to take a look at this timeline um, of the bus boycotts and take a minute or two to read through the timeline. And I want you to share with me in the chat, what do you notice about the timeline and what stands out to you about some of the events on the on the timeline? So go ahead and take a look at the timeline. And what do you notice about some of the events on the timeline? There was a previous boycott. Yeah, when did that happen? When was the earlier boycotts? The first boycotts? 53? 53, right? And when um, when does Rosa Park refuse to give up her seat on the bus? What year? 55. 55. So would love for people to share in the chat. What does that make you wonder? If the first boycotts were in 53 and Rosa Parks sat down in 55, what does that make you wonder? We'll have some questions in the chat. What are some things you're wondering right now about the boycotts? What happened in the meantime? <laughs> what happened after the first boycott? Why you didn't learn about the earlier boycotts? Okay, great. Great, why so long? Excellent, these are excellent questions. I did have someone in the chat say, were the boycotts successful? So that's a great question to be asking. So let's look at 56. So what happens in 56 um, in terms of the boycotts? What were the outcome of the boycotts? What does the Supreme Court decide? Yeah, they're unconstitutional. That, that segregation is unconstitutional. Is unconstitutional. Segregation was unconstitutional, right? So we could view the boycotts as a success, right? Because they met their goals of saying that segregation on buses was unconstitutional. Okay, so what I want you to do right now is to read this source from this textbook and to share in the chat, what is this source saying about why the boycotts were successful? Okay, it's saying the responsibility of the boycotts, right, was Rosa Parks and MLK. Emphasizes the leadership of King. Does it mention, okay. And I would say too that you never learn about Aurelia Browder. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's leaving out, we're thinking, we're, we're questioning this, right? It's leaving out a lot of people. Um, it's really just focusing the story on two people, which is Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want us to now look at this letter, which is a primary source from a woman named Joanne Robinson. And I want you to read in this letter, what does she say led to the success of the bus boycotts? What are some of the tactics and strategies that led to the success of the bus boycotts? What does Joanne Robinson's account say? Okay, thanks, Kathy. So Kathy's saying that things happened quickly. Activism started quickly after the women organized, right? Um, Kathy, can you share what organization did Robinson start? Robinson started the Montgomery, Montgomery's Women Political Council. Um, she was a professor, right? That organization was started in 54, which was a year before the boycotts that Rosa Parks took part in. Um, all right, Anna's mentioning they threatened their purses. That got attention, right? They're saying that they're going to use money as a way to boycott. Um, Rosalie said they're using carpooling instead of taking the buses. Um, and we're seeing a lot of different organizations involved, right? So if you zoom in on this line, there's been talk from 25 or more local organizations planning a citywide boycott of the buses. Okay, so I want you to think about the textbook that we just read. Does this source refute or corroborate the textbook. And corroborate means um, agree. Does this source refute or corroborate the textbook and why? Thanks, Julie. Julie's saying it's refuting the textbook, refuting, refuting. Okay. Which do you think gives us 
a more reliable perspective of the event and why. The primary source, the letter. Anna, can you share why you think the primary source is more accurate? Sorry, I had to find my uh, unmute. No problem. <laughs> I know I got you having a lot of details. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, because it's it's a, a letter, it's contemporary, it's from a person who was involved in a it's the time period it's uh direct involvement it, it, it's not even later um um than than the time period it, it's not even like a a few years later or a few weeks later it's actual during the events yes great okay now i want us to look at one more source take a look at this one um, this is from Bayard Rustin's diary, February 24th, 1956. Um, that was the year my mom was born. Um, so I want you to think about, um, what do you know about Bayard Rustin? And if you've never heard of him, that's also okay too. He's one of the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement. Nothing. Okay, that's okay. Thank you for being honest. Appreciate that. Friend of Dr. King. Yeah, they just made a movie about him. Shameless plug. One of my friends is dating someone who was in the movie. I'm so proud of him and his boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> the movie, okay, so who's Byron Rustin? Um, Byron Rustin was the logistics organizer behind the March on Washington. Um, he did all the organiz organizing, right? And, I th and, and he was one of Dr. King's best friends. And his story is not talked about a lot because he was gay and he was openly gay. And Dr. King um, thought that it was important to prioritize race over gay rights. And so he did not want Rustin at the forefront as a, as a face of the movement um, because he was really big on making sure that respectability politics um, played out and that people saw Black people as model citizens. Um, and they were concerned that if Rustin was open about his sexuality in the, as a public figure in the movement, it would detract from the movement. Um, what we'll see happen in, in the later in later periods is the Black Panthers and other groups will, will challenge this thinking um, and push for gay rights. And, but, you know, Rustin's, Rustin's work was critical and, and he's finally getting his due, um, you know, 60 years later um, with, you know, the movies that are coming out and all these wonderful things. So I want you to now take a look at this letter and what does Rustin say led to the success of the bus boycotts? Thanks, Linda, logistical organization. How many people, black folks working together, how many people were not riding the buses, carpools? 42,000 people. Great. They set up how many centers to make sure people can get carpools? 2030, 23, 23, beautiful, great. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here for the sake of our time and talk a little bit about the rest of this lesson, what it would look like with students, because this would be an hour long lesson. So after this, I would have students look at three more sources and we would talk about which sources corroborate each other and which sources refute one another. And what students are gonna find is that all the sources corroborate one another except for the textbook. And the textbook is not telling an accurate depiction and the primary sources are. And we talk about the validity of the primary sources. What is the validity of reading a diary, right? We, we know from reading, that from reading Rustin's diary that it's probably true because we're not necessarily making our diary public. So there's no reason to lie. Um, we talk about you know, the number of people who took part in this. Um, we talk about the timeline, how there was sustained action over a long period of time. Um, and we also talk about you know, in this lesson and subsequent lessons, how Rosa Parks legacy is infantilized. Um, that she was just some woman who didn't really think and sat down accidentally, right? And, and really the truth is she was a brilliant woman who was part of a strategic plan 
um, that was not an accident. And what does that mean? And what power does that take away from people when we, we talk about historical actors that way? So I want us to just reflect on this, this type of instruction. And this is the kind of instruction I want students to get in history. And first, let's just talk about, I actually put this question last and I probably should put this question first, but I would love for someone to come off a of mute and just share. When you teach the Montgomery bus boycotts this way, what myth does this lesson bust? The textbook tells the truth. Okay, it busts the myth that the textbook is telling the truth. What else specifically about the bus boycotts? What that the it was somehow accidental. Right, it was somehow accidental, yes. Why would politicians have an invested interest in making us think that the boycotts were accidental? Oh, we don't want boycotts. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, like come off mute. What what would you say? To minimize the power of their organizing right. and their movement. Yes. Right. To minimize the power. It's bad for business. <laughs> it's bad for business, right? No one wants more boycotts. They don't want people organizing, right? And these people were inferior in thinking. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. This this lesson taught this way shows us how brilliant black organizers are. I also want to talk about something that I hope you picked up on this nuance of how to incorporate queer history into, when I say queer history, gay rights history, into a lesson. I gave you some context about Byron Rustin, but I didn't talk about like what I think what some conservatives are afraid of is like, we're talking about sex and we're talking about all these like inappropriate things. No, I'm talking about what this man did that was brilliant and also sharing that he was gay. Just like I would share that one of the presidents was married to a woman, right? Like I would share Joe Biden's wife is Joe Biden, right? Donald Trump's wife was Melania Trump, right? I'm sharing that this was an aspect of his life. And we're talking about gay people as though they are integral to the story. And it's just a normal part of the lesson. Right. And when teachers integrate the history in this way, it helps kids to see that gay people, black people are just part of the normal story. We're not talking about black people only during February. We're not talking about gay people only during June. We're talking about them throughout. Right. Mm -hmm. Same like we're talking about Joanne Robinson. We're not just talking about Dr. King. We're talking about other black women. The question we started with. Is there other black women besides Rosa Parks? Yes, <laughs> who are critical, right? This is this is how we present representation in a way that just is organic and builds, builds. Um, I would love to hear some thoughts about why this form of instruction might be empowering um, and how it relates to today. What skills are kids getting out of this um, that relates to today? Feel free to jump in the chat and share some of your thoughts. Empathy, critical thinking. We're all part of history. Excuse me. I'm, interest. Yes. I have not used the chat. Can I say something? Sure, go for it. Okay. Uh, as far as the boycotts go, it's still the character of the leaders of the movement. They were not afraid of the system or the power structure. Once they got out of that fear of the power structure, they were able to operate and do what they planned to do. And the second thing I'd like to uh, mention about the boycotts was they took away money from the system. Yes. And, 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 and that hurt business. And right. They had to you know, listen to what that say about what they wanted. Yes. What money is taken away. It, Absolutely. It, it hurt. It hurt, it hurt, right? And we say, follow the money. And what we take away from this lesson is, I think someone also said this in the chat, is that we are a part of history. There were 42,000 people involved in these boycotts. We'll never know all their names. That's <laughs> that's right. us, that's right? That's, uh, uh, yeah. that's us, right. that's 230 people on this call who are gonna take action 
every day in their lives, right, to fight for democracy, and we might not make it into the textbooks. Uh, we right. probably won't, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we're not activists. And so I just want us to think about, and I always show kids this picture because they recognize Rosa Parks at the bottom, but they don't recognize these other faces. And I'll say to them, you're not gonna remember all the faces of people that are active, but we're all a part of history, right? And what I want us to think about, and you can read through this, this chart of key takeaways, is that this lesson teaches both content and skills. Yeah. And so if you look at the content, right, we're talking about people are under this misconception that the boys and cops were one day and Rosa sat on a bus. So that means I can show up to a Black Lives Matter protest for one day, go to brunch in Brooklyn, and I've done my job. Nope. The bus boycotts were over four years, <laughs> like over, you know, the, like from 53, there were some in Louisiana, right? Then there was the, the ones in Montgomery were a year and a half. Then they had to take it to the Supreme Court. That's a lot of work. That is sustained activism. It's not one person. It's a collective. We are a collective. Okay. And this was not accidental. This is well-trained, planned, and it is a blueprint for change. So politicians want to ban this because when we study the truth about the boycotts, and this is just one example of hundreds of examples of powerful black activists. When we study the truth about black activists, they give us the roadmap. Black activists tell us what to do. So politicians don't want us to know what black activists did because they're telling us how to get power. And that's why the politicians are working so hard to keep it from us because it gives us a roadmap. Now, this lesson would be entirely different if I just got up and lectured you on bullet points. It's not interesting. It's not as engaging, right? And so there's also really important for history instruction is the pedagogical skills that your teachers are giving kids. And this is often where well-intentioned teachers sometimes struggle. And so what this lesson also does, and some people were mentioning this in the chat, is it teaches you how to read primary sources, how to analyze sources, how to analyze an argument, how to make an argument, how to discuss, debate a topic, synthesize information, challenge a text. So this way, when I'm reading Fox News, I can question, hmm, this doesn't sound right. <laughs> this sounds off. Let me go check four other websites and see if it's saying the same thing. And in fact, when I check the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the Washington Post and the leading newspapers of the day, none of them corroborate Fox News because Fox News lies and the other news sources use facts, right? And so this is what we need to teach kids to be able to do so that they can apply it and transfer it to the current media climate that we're seeing. And that's getting even more challenging in today's world with like so many digital media sources, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> um, and so the core idea here that I want to show you about social studies instruction, and this is something you can ask teachers if they're if they're using and, and parents, um, you know, you can you talk to your kids' teachers about this. But excellent social studies instruction is about diverse perspectives and critical thinking skills. We can't just replace one textbook that's conservative with a liberal textbook. Because while it might be liberal and we like those ideas better, that's still not critical thinking. And so kids need to be able to think for themselves and be able to create arguments that we're going to have a successful society. Okay, now I'm gonna say some things that you're gonna be like really <laughs> depressed about because <laughs> they're scary. <laughs> So I just want everybody to take a deep breath <laughs> and know that we're gonna like get through this together um, and talk a little bit about the truth and how we're gonna move forward. Okay, so why is history education under attack? You know, I shared all these things. Um, this isn't new. So since the Reagan administration, there has never been a federal set of standards of what kids could learn, should learn about history education. Um, there is a federal state of standard, set of standards for science, math, and reading. Um, there is not one for history. That is because history is political. When you teach history a certain way, 
you um, are going to vote for Republicans. If you teach history another way, you're going to vote for Democrats. And so the government has never done a healing process to actually teach the true history of America. And what I mean by that is, for example, in Germany, after the Holocaust, there was a healing process that took place to re-educate the population about the Holocaust. That has never happened after the Civil War in America. We never had a time where we re-educated our, our population about white supremacy and what happened, the genocide that happened in this country. So, and the Republican Party is invested in keeping it that way. Um, now, the Republican education platform is not a secret. So this information comes from two sources. One is called um, Project 2025, which was started by a group um, called the Heritage Foundation. Mm -hmm. And the Heritage Foundation helped Reagan um, lay out all his public policy policies. They support Republican candidates. Um, and they are ready to embrace whoever is the Republican president in 2025 if they get there. Um, we need to we need to make sure they don't get there. And if you go to Project 2025, um, sorry, Margaret, to clarify, I see your question. We do have social studies standards. Um, they're not content standards. Um, so when we go to um, 20, Project 2025, there are certain goals that the Republican Party has which is um, to eliminate the Federal Department of Education. Anytime the Republicans say they want to eliminate federal programming, that usually means they're gonna leave it up to the states to decide. Now, what that creates is a two-tiered system in our country because then some people have rights and other people do not. And so that's, that's a huge problem. Um, they want to eliminate Title I funding. Title I funding is a provision that gives low-income schools additional funding. So if the school has 40% of students in poverty, they qualify for Title I funding. The Republican Party wants to totally eliminate that. Um, Title IX is it provides protections against gender discrimination, and they want to eliminate that as well in our schools. Um, you have seen this recently with the congressional hearings, um, but they want to erode the trust in higher education. And so um, Trump has been talking about in his on his website about establishing something called the American Academy, where any schools that offer programs in DEI or women's studies or black studies will lose funding for the federal government. And he instead wants to create an American Academy where people can do online videos to get educated. Now, if you remember, he had a Trump Academy that failed and went bankrupt and caused people to go into a lot of debt. So an American Academy probably is not going to work. Um, they also have had the goal of eliminating affirmative action, which they completed. So what is the intended outcome of these policies? I'm gonna say it very plainly. Um, it's to eradicate public education so that they have an uninformed electorate who does not know how to challenge white supremacy and white men in power. That is the goal of these policies. Education is a, not a perfect vehicle, but it is a vehicle to achieve higher social class in America. And so if we eliminate public education, we eliminate opportunities for black people, for immigrants and for women. These are the goals. And I think we need to call them out very plain and simply. And the reason why I say we have to call them out very plain and very simply and direct people, and again, this is not a secret, right? It's in, um, it's in the Heritage Project paper. It's on Trump's website. He's got all the videos up, right? And the reason why we have to call it out simply is because they're trying to confuse people with bigger words like critical race theory. And they're trying to distract people with all of these laws that are coming out. But what yeah. that ultimately does is it creates confusion in the system. 
And if there's confusion in the system, we think the system is failing us. And if we think the system is failing us, we're not going to invest money in it and we're going to get rid of it. And that's what they're trying to do to public education. And so I think it's just so important that we know exactly what the end goal is. And the end goal is to make sure there's not a smart electorate. And clearly, if we are trying to get rid of Title I funding and we're trying to get rid of Title IX, that directly helps low-income people and women and people who are gay, right? That's who, that's who that helps, right? And so if we're getting rid of it, we're directly attacking them. So it's no secret. So we need to call that out really clearly. And that's why I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really emphasizing this. Okay. Now I also wanna talk a little bit about what a lot of Democrats are doing that is hurting history education. So since the pandemic, there have been dips in literacy rates across the country. A lot of Democrats are mandating scripted curricula with an emphasis on reading instruction. Now that doesn't sound bad and it isn't bad, but here's how it's playing out in implementation. So because there are state tests in K through eight for English and math and not state tests in most states for social studies and science, what is happening now is because we're mandating schools improve literacy, schools are making schedules that cut out science and history blocks. Not only does this take away kids' opportunities to learn important subjects, but it's counter to research. Research shows that when you have a reading-based social studies curriculum, you improve literacy rates. It makes sense. If you're reading nonfiction, that's harder than reading a novel. It's more complicated than reading a novel, and that improves literacy. What this is also doing to teachers is adding another layer of a pain point for teachers. Because if you're mandating teachers to use certain curriculum, well, then they have to learn a new curriculum. Are you paying teachers more to learn a new curriculum? No. Are you giving teachers more professional development to learn this curriculum? No. Is that If you are, is that professional development good? Not necessarily. And so it's causing teachers to quit at a higher rate because they're not properly compensating teachers for the changes that they're asking them to do. Imagine going into another job and saying to someone, you know what, you have to learn a whole new skill set, but we're not going to compensate you for that training. Mm -hmm. And so that's contributing to this wider teacher shortage. And so again, there's nothing wrong with us trying to address reading levels. We absolutely should address kids' reading levels because if kids can't read, they can't do anything else. But we have to also then do other things that help retain good teachers because nothing at the end of the day replaces a good teacher. It's the number one factor that leads to improved childhood outcomes. And there is also research that shows that when a child has a black teacher, their graduation rates improve dramatically. Why? Because Black teachers don't usually perpetuate racism towards kids that look like them and have a deeper belief in all kids. And so we need to retain all teachers, but especially teachers of color. So what can we do about this? There's a few things. Number one, if you are a parent, you need to join the PTA. You need to talk to teachers. You need to listen to what they're, they're experiencing. Um, you need to make sure that your school district is including content equity. And what that means is that all kids are getting equal amount of time in all subjects. There's a reason why all subjects are in the schedule. <laughs> they all matter, right? We can't have math without reading. We can't have, you know, we, we, they all matter. And so we can't cut things. You know, I haven't even touched on arts, but that, you know, we can't cut things from the schedule, right? Kids deserve to have all of that. Um, we need to make sure that school districts pass budgets that allocate money to teacher salaries and professional development because those are the two things that lead to teacher retention. There's this big misunderstanding that if we just give people more, um, you know, more technology, like they'll be great. No, we just need teachers to, yeah. to be able to do their jobs well. Um, and be paid for it, right? And so a lot of times budgets don't reflect that. So for example, it took 10 years for New York State to increase 
the school budget at the state level, 10 years. That's a liberal state. Mayor Adams and Kathy Hochul right now are trying to cut the school budgets. These are Democrats, right? So we have to hold them accountable, even the ones that are liberal, right? It's not, you know, that's where they need to hold, be held accountable. And then we need to, you know, really make sure that your child's school is teaching inclusive history all year long, not just during special months, right? So it is not, you know, February starting tomorrow, you know, two days, right? That's when MLK comes out. We need to make sure MLK and, you know, is not the only thing being talked about. And that also kids are learning Black history every single week, right? And that goes for other groups as well. Um, children should have a reflection of their identity. They should also learn about other groups of people. Um, really important. And then we also need to make sure that people very clearly understand the Republican goals for education and get out the vote. I imagine even if you said to a Trump supporter, how do you feel about public education being defunded and you having to figure out where to send your kids to school? I don't think any mother really wants that. Moms are already really busy. <laughs> So I think if we explain this to people in a really like clear, easy way, they will, um, even the Trump supporters will get it, right? But I think most importantly, um, before you get to those people, you get to the people who are on your side in your communities, but maybe just don't know that this is what the goal is, right? Because they're busy, because they're overwhelmed, because they don't come to, they're not able to come to events like this, right? And so, um, you know, I think that's really important. We do have a few minutes and I saw a question in the chat and then I would, I'll be happy to answer other questions in the chat. Um, so again, I see people saying they would love materials. Please fill out the Google form so I can get those to you. Um, I keep putting it in the chat, but I would love for you to put that, you know, fill out that Google form so I can get you the information that you need. Um, I saw some people putting things in the chat about standards. So, states have their own set of standards, but there aren't federal standards for social studies. And so the federal standards for social studies are skills-based standards. So it says analyze primary sources, but we what we aren't aligned on is content. So for example, in um, New York, it is a requirement to teach um, about Frederick Douglass's narrative and Frederick Douglass's life that is not necessarily a requirement in every single other state. And so what that leads to is two divergent history stories. Um, and so that's what I was talking about with standards. We have six minutes. Um, and if some of you have to head off, please do. But I'm just curious if anyone has any questions or, or you want to put in the chat or any other things that you're wondering about. I have uh, a question. Your hand. Hi, this is Esther Hi. Coleman. I'm Thank in North, Car North Carolina. Um, my daughter's an adult now, but when she was in middle school here, her social studies, she came home and she said her social studies textbook sa said that the slaves were happy. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe her at first. So I checked with her teacher who confirmed that that was true. And the teacher said all she did was to try to teach around it. I'm not sure what that meant. What would you say to a parent in terms of combating misinformation like that? It's kind of dangerous to go out there on your own and try mm -hmm. to do that. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think you know, now you're also in um, this, you know, you now you're in a contentious time where teachers are getting fired if they're they're challenging these things. Um, as a parent, I think there's more power in numbers. And so I think that um, you need to get other parents together and talk about this, right? Make your voices heard. I also think it's really important, and I know Red Wine and Blue does a lot of amazing work around relational organizing and relational conversations. I think it's really important to assess where this educator is at. 
And what I mean by that is there are some people who deliberately want to tell a false narrative. There are other teachers who are completely overburdened, would love to teach more inclusive history, but do not feel like they have the time to revamp their schedule and need more training and need more support and need people to help them think about how they can integrate history that is inclusive into their curriculum without reinventing the wheel. And so I think as a parent, having a conversation with the, with a teacher like that is to ask questions. Can you share with me why you thought this was useful information to share with students? Do you think this is accurate? How are my students going to respond to this? How does a student of color feel when they read this? Right? These are some of the questions you can you can determine, okay, does this person actually believe racist things? Or does this person, you know, did they make a mistake that like definitely is wrong, but like needs other tools to get there? And so I think that that's how we have to fix these these things. It's not acceptable in any way, shape, or form, but we have to think about how do we reach that person so that they can change their behavior. Um, and you know what? You need to know how to reach the school board to change. Absolutely. <laughs> so I would say this isn't about going to the teacher. Go to the school board, get your parents together and their public comment times. And you can query the textbooks. Hey, if yeah. they want to ban books, why don't you go query a textbook? That would be what I would say as well. Thanks. And Sorry. No, 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 that's that's valuable. I guess I'm saying go to the teacher first because I don't think it creates like a healthy environment for a student. If you if you're a parent and your child's in that class and you immediately go to the school board complaining to the to the about a teacher, that teacher might retaliate against No, no, you. don't go about no. it. Yeah, I'm don't saying go, go to the teacher first, then go to the school board, but you should also as a proactive step, I think what I hear you saying is go to the school board first with these ideas. About um, the curriculum, fact. if I may say so, yes, two things curriculum. that are not being uh, clarified is in states that are strong unions, number one, teacher unions, is very debilitating for parents to be able to, even school boards, to be able to do things. In the no. state of New Jersey, if a teacher does is not following the curriculum or doing well, it's too, if they're tenured, it's too expensive. It's $100,000 cost to the district to get rid of a teacher, to fire them. That's just not heard of. Second of all, you can't go to the teacher about curriculum in states with or without a union. It's the curriculum director or the curriculum in the um, school right. district that is the person right. you can start with. But you have to go, and it's not even the school board, because they relinquish that to the people that are knowledgeable. These are not the paid jobs. These are not specialists on school boards. So that's almost a myth. You have to, um, right. there is so much to do it, and 10 years is like nothing yes. to get something I mean, like this I'm taken sorry. care of. Yes. Can you and hear me, Jillian? Yes. Jillian, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. What I will say is that every state is different. And what you need to know are the rules in your state. And that's exactly. something that we do go over at, with our troublemaker training that we do on Thursday evening. So not this coming Thursday, but the following Thursday. And we kind of walk you through um, how you find these things out. So in some places, it might be a curriculum director. In some places, it 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 is in a lot of places, actually, it is the school board. And in a lot of places, you know, you can start with the teachers. But the point, the important thing is to start. So mm -hmm. that is what I wanted to say as we are closing out this evening. Jillian, did you have any Thank last you, words you wanted to share before we close down? Yeah, no, I think that point leads me to like a really great point, which is that at every level, there's work to be done. So there's work to be done on the teacher level. There's work to be done at the school board level. There's work to be done with the curriculum designers. Um, and every single person plays a role in creating change. And there's no right or wrong way to make change as long as you're making the change. Um, and so I think, you know, it's really important that we think about what our gifts are and how we're going to advocate um, for, for, for training. Um, what I would like to just say as my last final thought is um, I would love for you to get more involved and I would love to share the resources that I have. So please um, reach out to me if you need any of those resources. 
Um, I'm putting again, my email in the chat. And I am just so inspired that all of you are here tonight. Um, it just really makes me proud that we have so many people engaged and caring about all of these issues. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion. Um, thank you for your comments and for this beautiful supportive community. Have a great, have a great evening.